My name's Eric, and I'm an alcoholic. And uh, I don't know how to do this at all, really. Plus the fact that, I mean, uh, I've only just started being able to speak again because about three weeks ago I had all my teeth taken out and, uh, and these implants put in. And um, so it's all kind of feels funny in there. And I'm, you know, I'm, ju- I'm just trying to kind of overcome this list and a whistle, which you can hear. So, um, and actually, uh, some of it is quite nice because I sound like people I used to admire, like Otis Rush and Ray Charles, who used to sing with a lip. But that's cool. But one of the great things about this was that one of the, my dreads as a, a practicing alcoholic was dentistry. Um, it was like a, a lot of other things that, that, that were really just not uh, not available to me. I had such a, uh, you know, the dysfunctionality in my life was so pronounced that I didn't even see a toothbrush until I was about 18. You know, I was I, very poor stuff. All that raised with, you know, in a two up, two down, where there was an outside you know, zinc bath and no bathroom. And so, but I remember being in class at school about uh, 10 years old at the back of one of my front teeth fell off. I mean, and, and that's where a lot of my kind of disease started to kick in because I started lying. And uh, I think I'd already kind of developed the, that hot, the thing that, you know, Lauren and other people have talked about, that thing about changing the way I felt. I started changing the way I felt right then and that obviously before because um, my teeth fell off because of sugar. And I started eating sugar. Um, I mean, I can't even remember when I was probably five years old. Sugar on bread and butter. And that was like, a, I don't know, it was like a post-war thing in England. That that's what you did. Poor families did that. Um, they used to put sugar in milk to feed the children so that the children would, would drink the milk. And it was, it was like it was part of bad education, uh, all kinds of uh, just dysfunctionality. And, um, and so I was kind of set up. I was ready for this stuff. And, uh, and, I, and I, you know, there were so many other ways that it was coming into my life. I lived in a village in the country in England where we had this thing called the British Legion, which was like a veterans club society, you know, and um, and I would see the ground. We would, as kids, would be taken and we'd be stuck outside, put outside with a packet of um, crisps or whatever you call them here, potato chips and, and a Coke or something. And they would go inside and they would change, you know, the adults would change. And they'd go in kind of quiet and reserved and miserable. And I, you'd hear them changing inside. Into, <laughs> Into kind of happy, uh, uninhibited, uh, you know, gregarious people, and they'd be, and they'd be having the time of their lives, and then they'd come out, and then they'd be, you know, once they were kind of out again, and they'd take a sign, there would be a shift back somehow, and it would be a little bit more pronounced, it'd be a bit more kind of um, aggressive and sullen, uh, and you know, it was kind of like that was like a little microcosm of what my kind of drinking was like, that I would be, you know, just shy, withdrawn terrified, fear-based human being who, who once I got something inside of me became, you know, anybody and was up for anything. And then as it started to wear off, I became malevolent and violent and aggressive and, and miserable and, and in the end suicidal. And, uh, and that, that's what brought me here. And, and I, you know, the one thing that you always, you know, that I go over and over in my head, and whenever I think about what I'm going to say at a meeting is that apart from I'm being blessed. You know, I wonder why I was chosen for this and why we get to be chosen. I mean, I wouldn't even think about how that affects you, what you think about that. But I know for me, I don't understand why some people don't want it. I mean, I've brought, I've, I've done some 12-step work where I've brought people to the door and I've seen them turn away, walk away. And I've seen others die, you know, deliberately die when confronted with the whole notion of getting on this and, uh, and looking at their past and trying to uh, do the work that, 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 that is involved. And, um, and, I, and I don't understand why they didn't want to do it. You know? And why me, why you, why we get to be fortunate enough to... to the miracle I'm talking about is the wanting. That's the miracle in my life, is that I wanted this um, enough to do the hard work. And, I, you know, I found it, I'm sure we've all... And I'm sure the newcomers find it very, very powerful. I can't even remember. I mean, that seems like a fog, like there's a fog between me now and where I was at then. You know, that was 
because I know I was just driven by fear. And like I remember coming to meetings, trying to impress everybody with the fact that I'd been around for a while. So, you know, how did how does a newcomer do that? You know, I wanted everyone. It was impossible. I wanted to pretend like I'd done the steps. I wanted to pretend like I was, you know, three or four years sober when I was only six weeks. And it, and and that the pain of that, you know, the pain of that self consciousness of um, the pain of asking for help. That, to me, was very, very hard work. I don't know anybody um, who seriously works on this program who finds it easy because it's not supposed to, because it requires that we that we put one foot in front of the other. And we and, and the most courageous people in the world, in my book, are recovering alcoholics. The people that walk through that door. And on a date, and that's still the same for me now. You know, driving up here tonight. I, if I was, I have to hand it over. I have to hand it over to to my higher power because, and I, and that's easy for me now. I just say, you know, I don't know what to do. Get me there. I mean, I pray about like each mile of the road I'm driving. Get me there safe. Get me something to eat. You know, <laughs> let the people be nice to me. Let and then, and then don't let and try to keep me from talking about what I think. You know, because that is a complete waste of time and it. And it, and it, and it uh, and they all know, you know, they all, we are, you know, it's like we're all kind of experts on one fucking thing or another. But <clears throat> so, and, and you know, and I just hope that he, you know, sometimes he, he, well, he answers most of my, but he got me here. It's like I think it was Ted said that, you know, that whole thing about, uh, you know, I'm paying back because so, I, I prayed all through my drinking to be got out of every situation I was in, you know, to be relieved of this, to be got through that, and I'll never do it again, and, uh, and I'd do it again, and I'd ask, and I was always delivered. Now, and that's the other thing, is why was I, uh, and so I, I, and the thing is, you know, really it's none of my business. That's the, that's the, the kind of, the, the kernel of it all, is that I'm not supposed, to, I don't think I'm supposed to know, and whether I think I'm supposed to know or not doesn't make any difference, because I'm not going to ever find out. You know, I don't think I will. Uh, it's only when I look back on the path that I've already traveled that I see how when I've been there meeting that person, there's been some kind of connection where they meet another person that somehow brought to, you know, the program or something. And then I see that every girlfriend I've ever had or every, you know, journey I've ever taken has been in order for me to do some, it's all about service. And the thing is that I can't govern that. I have no control over it, and really all I've got to remember to do is just show up, uh, and, the th- and, and the rest is done for me. Uh, because I don't, you know, the minute I try to figure out how this works, I don't need to come here anymore. And that's, and that's a frightening one, because I know people that do, and I guess, they, some, I know some that do, and it's like, well, I'm getting off on a tangent, and they turn into lecturers, and they turn into experts, and... And I'm not, that's not what I want. I, I like to hear people that are, you know, around a long time who still say, like, I don't know how to do this. You know, I don't know what, I'm frightened. Or, because then I know that they're human and I can, be, uh, you know, because I, it's like I go back to that thing of authority. I can't be around authority. I, I need humility. I need humility as an example. I need to see that someone could stay sober a long time and not become authority, not become, you know, like a governing body, not become an expert, that they can be, they can retain their innocence, that they can be childlike and still be adult, you know. And and that, that's what, I find that here. I don't find it anywhere else. And I, I know there are great people out there without programs who just seem to be on the path. And I do meet them from time to time. But if I want to be guaranteed for that kind of exposure, I come to an AA meeting. And I get it here. And uh, so, I, I mean, my story is very, very simple. I just, you know, it's, I'm, I'm just the same as everybody else here. It got hairy. It, uh, um, it got good. I crossed the line. It got nasty. And somewhere, you know, and I don't, you know, with that whole thing about I knew for a very, very, very long time that I crossed that line. I don't remember crossing it, but I knew for at least the last 10 years of my drinking, I think, that I had to stop, and I would. Rem- I remember getting, waking up, coming to, and and thinking, well, today is the day. I've got to stop this today, and I can't. T- I can't. I can't. I don't want to tell anybody about that because I don't want to make any promises to anyone. <laughs> so this is something I want to do on my own, and then when I've done it, I can say to somebody, look, I've done. It. I've stopped, 
And, uh, but I'll just have a drink first to kind of like get the... So that my mind can function, you know. So that I can figure out how, to, how I'm going to do it. And of course, the first one wouldn't even go down. It would just be reject. My body would reject it, and I'd be dry heaving, and then it would be like, and it was vodka, you know. But of course, I'm sure most of us know that one. And uh, and finally, the third or fourth one would go down, and then the sh- then I'd go, I'd be fine, and and I think right now. So what should I? How would I go about this? Um, I don't know. I'll, I'll take the bottle down to the other room, and I'd move around the house, you know. <laughs> Um, postponing, postponing the actual whatever it was I thought I was going to do, postponing it until the bottle was empty, and I was passed out again. And uh, and, it was, and and you know, while I was doing that, I was thinking, well, this afternoon, this afternoon I'll stop, you know. And of course, this afternoon was gone, you know. And, I, and I'd wake up, and it would be dark, and I wouldn't know whether that darkness was morning or evening. I mean, I didn't know. I'd be at home, and I didn't know where I was. You know, I was. Um, and and I was married. I had a, a very successful career, and I, this has been a great thing for me in my uh, journey was being able to tell people um, that acquisition is not it. Um, because by the time I was 23, I was a millionaire with the gift that God gave me as a musician. I was making money without wanting to make money. I didn't I didn't have to stop it coming in, and I tried very hard. Believe me. <laughs> And I would leave every band. The minute they thought they wanted to be on TV, I was gone. You know? <laughs> there was some, I actually, would, see, the, anon, the anonymous part of the program was very familiar because somehow or another, I wanted that for me anyway. I wanted to be able to be good at something, but without anybody knowing it. But I did want them to know it. It was like that whole paradox of, I don't want you to know, but I want the kudos. And I had the madness, insanity even then. So, but, um, the whole thing about that was that I didn't want to be rich. I didn't want to be successful. And, and, and as long as I had that going on, I could not stop it. And, and I'm sure, it's, you know, people that want money, want success, it just doesn't happen because there's something, there's like a paradox in there. Um, but I do know that having all that stuff, and having a beautiful wife and a great home and a career that just shone, you know, no matter what I tried to do to destruct, the whole thing. It kept getting better and better. And uh, in spite of all that, at the end of each day, I was considering suicide. And uh, now, see, that, how does that make sense? You know, that, and, I, and I know that there are people um, who probably come into this program without very much who think that this is going to get them that. You know? and, and maybe it will. But, the, but for sure, along with it come a lot of other problems and, and some of those things I don't know if I'm ready for now. I mean, I'm still quite, you know, self-destruct. I mean, I do like to uh, sabotage, self-sabotage a lot. And I still practice that. I still kind of set about trying to undermine it so that, so that I'm basically so that I can survive, really, and, and retain some kind of anonymity. Um, so for that part of me, um, there, I'm very lucky and blessed in that I did for instance, have a fairly strong belief in God when I came here. That was not a problem for me. And I did want to be anonymous. So when people uh, came up to me at, at meetings and asked for my autograph, it was easy for me to say, no, you know, I'm, I'm Eric the alcoholic. Um, and there was a time, I think, where there was definite conflict in it for me that when I first got sober, which is a long while ago now, it was back in 80, 1981, um, I went out on the road, you know, I went out on tour, and it sounded like shit, and I felt, and it was an awful experience, and of course it was everything, you know, I was in treatment, and everyone said, counselors and fellow patients alike said, you know, um, don't do anything, it's like the whole thing, don't do anything, don't get involved with anybody, don't make any decisions, don't do anything for a year, and within six months I was touring America on a massive scale, <laughs> hating every minute of it, and, uh, and being, being around, um, very, very dangerous situations all the time. And not, and really kind of feeling miserable. And I suppose, you know, I was, you know, I was on the way back. And I, and I relapsed as a result of that. And, and in my, I went back into treatment. And in that period of time, um, being back in treatment, I had to confront the idea that, you know, that was, um, I was either going to come back here as an alcoholic above all, uh, or I, I was probably going to die, you know. And this was, 
I mean, I had it. I have it in spades, this disease. I really do. I have it on every level. I mean, I, I'm, I, I project all the time. I'm a fear-based guy. Um, that, you know, shame, I go into shame spirals at the drop of that. I'm getting better. Like, like Lauren said, I'm improving. But, I don't do anything. I mean, all I do is I, I come to meetings and I, and I, and I pray that God will do most of the rest. I will try, I work the steps, but I'm very conscious of the fact that my, my defects are not really mine to control. I mean, I can't, I've never been able to, like someone else said, I don't know how to hand it over. I still don't know quite how to hand it over other than to try and help somebody else. You know, when, when I get into that predicament about self-obsession, I kind of got a, a, a switch where I think, well, think, Think about somebody else. Don't do something for somebody else. That's my way of handing it over. But I don't know if that's the right. I mean, it's the way I do it. But for me, it's still, it's tough, you know. And uh, the thing about where I've had to work very hard is being, you know, having this kind of celebrity as a musician and being, like, on the media. Uh, and, you know, and, uh, and there's recently been a thing where I tried to, I've, I've put together a, a center in the Caribbean to to help people. And I, and I realize that that's not an AA project. You know, I've had to kind of really work hard on my boundaries around this stuff. And that's, you know, treatment centers are not AA. You know, that's like, they, 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 they work with the 12-step program and they advise. But nevertheless, you know, I've, and, and it's still a separate issue. And when I was confronted with these people that, you know, that I put together to make this thing work, they said, well, you're going to go out there and have to go out there. You are our only asset. Nobody knows this fucking thing is here. You've got to go and tell them that it's here. And you've got to, and in order, you know, in order to do that, well, I said, well, what am I going to do? I go on 60 Minutes to the, the Today Show. I do like all kinds of fucking magazine and newspaper articles. And in the course of that, I'm on the edge the whole time of breaking my anonymity. And that's been a real tough thing. And, you know, that's given me, that whole exercise gave me a great a learning curve about what, how important my anonymity is to me. And it is really about my boundary, about, you know, how much I, because now I've got to the point where I love this thing we have. I love it above all. And even when I say that, I don't feel a tingle coming to me because it's a spiritual thing for me that, that, that what we do and the way we help other people and ourselves in, in the process is not to be fucked with. It is not to be compromised. Yeah. And I've been, you know, and, and it's like, it's amazing how, how when, when people are faced with that, how it tantalizes people. You know, like, uh, I remember my sponsor being involved in the kind of sort of business project where, you know, they had a long conference with these other people that he was involved with on some business thing. And it was all folding. It was getting crazy. And somehow or another, he sorted it all out. And after the meeting, one of these guys came up to him and said, you know, I don't know, what, I don't know how you did that. And it was brilliant. But what, what's your secret? What, what, what have you got in, going on? And he said, well, um, it, it's nothing to do with me. And it is a secret. <laughs> you know, and that was like, uh, that's what it is. <laughs> and, and I love that, you know, that, that, and, and that guy, you know, he's, he's got 20 years and he is like a, a saint to me, but he's one of those guys that says, I don't know, I don't know what I'm doing, I just go to meetings, you know, and I love that, but but it is very difficult. I've had to do a lot of work going up, going to, to talk to people in treatment and saying, like, you know, the, that primary purpose, you know, where they, when we read the preamble, our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve it, right? That is my primary purpose. And I've had to be, you know, that my primary purpose is not making sure this fucking treatment center works. My primary purpose is if I get the opportunity going in there and telling the alcoholics in there, the recovering people that want to stay sober, my story, not what I think, or not, you know, please get your other pals to come in because we need the money, you know. But seriously, just to be there so that they can see that I'm a guy with a load of money who's had a great career but who still occasionally thinks about suicide and, you know, although that got a lot better, I can assure you. But but that that is not it. That it is about peace of mind which comes from other other people, comes from our common welfare. Um, and that's what I always rely on, you know, that um in any given difficult situation, there's two options for me. One is to isolate and try and figure it out, 
and eventually he can self-destruct and go down the road that I've already traveled. The other one is to come here and ask you for what you did when you had the similar experience. And that's the one I've chosen most. And it worked. And it, and it is usually, you know, I'll avoid people that try and, you know, proselytize or, or, or lecture or tell me what they think. I will say, well, tell me what you did when this happened to you so that I get the experience. Uh, and just, and usually it is the simplest thing imaginable, you know. And that's what works. And, uh, so that's it for me. I mean, I flew all this way to come to this meeting and, uh, <laughs> uh, and, I, and I'm really, really, I'm really glad to be here. Um, I, I had no idea. I, I remember actually driving up the coast thinking that about 20 years ago, I came up here to make a record at a place called Shangri-La. And man, I, I, is, it, is it different now? I mean, am I, I don't know if it's still there, the place, but some of those guys are dead, you know. Um, one of them's in, and this was a group called The Band, you know, that was a great band, and one of them hung himself, and he was like, we were, we drank together. I mean, he was like a Grand Marnia freak. He drank Grand Marnia out of the bottle, and I love, man, that, that's a man's way of drinking, you know. Um, and he hung himself, and I thought, and I've seen so many people, lost so many friends who didn't get this light shone in their lives. And which brings me back to that thing is like God, uh, God somehow or another chose us. And now we get to choose. And, and that's the other thing about this program that I love the most is that I have a choice today. And like Lauren also said, I can look back and see that it's all been choice. And it still is, you know. I can choose. And, and I am responsible for my own happiness. And, and for my my own life, I'm totally responsible today. I don't blame anymore. I try to still on occasion because I am an alcoholic, and, and I will always, I will always, always act in that typical way. My first response is usually to you know, fuck it, it's his fault or her fault, and then I modify, and and that, and then I act. I act usually on the modification, and. Uh, for that, I'm really grateful. Um, it's been almost 12 years for me, and, and and I guess I've got another 12 to go before I'll have paid back my debt, and uh, and I hope a bit more, you know. Um, I don't ever really think about this as being a long, long road. It's still one day at a time for me. I really don't make too many plans. I, I try to take the program to everything I do, the way I... The way I love, the way I live, the way I work. It's about spontaneity and being in the moment. And we're very, very lucky to be given this gift. And, uh, and I'm very grateful for you listening to me tonight. Thanks. Thanks for letting me share. Thank you. I'm Stevie, I'm an alcoholic, I'm an addict, and I too am nervous. I've been sober today by the grace of God, and that's the only way I know of. Everything I've done got me here. I know that um, a lot of a lot of what got me here was also the grace of God, because I couldn't have... Uh, couldn't have needed the questions or had the questions, I don't think, that uh, that I try to find out the answers to these days without the grace of God. I started off my drinking and using career, oh, I guess, early 60s, when I was somewhere around uh, seven or eight years old. I uh, grew up in an alcoholic family. My father was an alcoholic. And even though I saw the problems that alcohol caused in our family, I still found it attractive for some reason. I don't know what that was. I thought I was missing something. I was always a kid who was afraid I was going to miss something. Somewhere along the line... 
I started trying to uh, find out why my father would go back and, and continue to drink, even though every time he did, I saw what happened, which was big fights, you know, violence. Um, and we were always real scared of him. But he continued to do it anyway, and I never, I never did understand what that was until one day, a few years later, I realized that I wasn't doing anything any differently other than making a little bit more money and it added a few drugs to it, you know. Um, I guess about seven or eight years old, I started stealing drinks. Either, uh, well, my parents used to have these, these 42 parties. And quite a few people would come over and they'd be uh, having a Tom Collins or whatever, you know. And when somebody wasn't looking, I'd take one of the drinks and run in the kitchen, you know, and make them a new one. And uh, <laughs> refresh their drink, you know. It's just that I would refresh my memory about what it tasted like a lot of the time, you know. I never really, I never really thought that it tasted very good or anything and then then one day I tried to I tried to uh make myself a drink out of my dad's bourbon that was in the freezer. It didn't taste very good either. I guess it was the wrong brand or something, I don't know. But somewhere along the line I started finding that attractive somehow. About the same time my friend I uh here knows a throat doctor who it was general practice with him when you, when you went in for him to take a look up your nose, he would squirt you full of what I later found out was a strong solution of liquid cocaine. And I never really knew why my face was numb when I left there and why I felt a little different, but I later on found out that I didn't know how to breathe without the stuff. Because you know? it was in a nose spray he gave me. The first bottle said use you know, once every 24 hours. The second bottle said, use two or three sprays every 12 hours. And the next one said, use as needed. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> but I guess as I was going into junior high was when I started, when I really started trying to drink. We'd moved to Graham, Texas. And I really didn't want to go at all. Um, I'd, I'd gotten in the first band that I really wanted to be in and was excited about it. And we had to move and I had to give up everything, you know, including my way. We got to Graham and, uh, my parents had told me we were going to be there for about six weeks. And that was, about six weeks into the six months that we stayed there. While I was going to school there, actually the first day I went to school there in Graham, Texas, just to show you what kind of, how much I liked it. I got kicked out of school three times the first day. <laughs> and, uh, I didn't even do anything. You know, I just went to school and they didn't like how my belt was, uh, they didn't like how my hair was cut twice, you know. And, uh, I real quick found this guy that sold, he sold Alka seltzer bottles full of full of sour mash. Continue to find him every day, you know. Even though I, did, I didn't like how it tasted or anything, it just kind of helped me smooth along, you know. Because there wasn't anything that I really wanted there. I'd get beat up all the time, and and there wasn't anybody to play any music with. Well, we stayed there for about six months, and finally, I just told my parents that I wasn't going back to school anymore. And so that ended up being about the same time we moved back to Dallas. And back to Dallas for me was, uh, I didn't realize what I was doing at the time, but really all I, all I really was doing here at the time was, uh, well, I was trying to play music and everything, but the, the main thing I was doing was hanging out with the kids down the street. And, uh, what they did all the time was, see how they could get high this way or that way, you know. And I thought that well, all I was doing was just trying to be in with the people, you know, with these kids. What I was really doing was learning how to get high and stay high all the time and run away from what was going on, which was uh, 
I guess what was going on really was that, uh, you know, people grow up and they learn things about living life and, uh, and grow. I didn't, uh, I never, that never dawned on me. I just thought you just kind of went from day to day and you got older and then things happened and you graduate and, or quit school or whatever. But anyway, I, 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 I had a bad, had a good and had a, had a, so this, this pill was this kind and this was that kind and if you hit real on this just joints you might get a buzz. You just scared to though, at the time. The thing was is, that was the only thing I knew how to do. The only thing I knew how to do was just try to, try to get by every day. I wasn't really learning anything about living life. There was really no information at home. Because I, I couldn't, it was pretty violent in my house. I couldn't go and ask, ask my dad about things. Um, I couldn't go ask my dad about about school or about girls or about anything. Because it was uh, it was pretty much you're supposed to know that stuff on your own, <laughs> or just leave me alone. Is that your stuff? Get it out of the room, you know. So I. Uh, I just continued to try to find out things from the kids down the street, and that wasn't the way to really go. I didn't know that. What I did keep learning, though, was about was about bands and what. Not to blame, not to blame my drinking or anything on bands, but I sure learned a lot about it there, because <laughs> that was and still is, unfortunately, a lot of in a lot of places. That's where a lot of the myth about it's real neat to get high. Or real cool to get high. That's where I learned a lot of it. Because a lot of the people I really looked up to really knew how to drink and really knew how to get high. And, uh, along with every time I would get in a better band, it seemed like there were better drugs. <laughs> and, uh, better brand of a gin or whatever, you know. And I always thought I had to keep up. I just thought I had to keep up. Why that was, I don't know. I would see, uh, I would see someone who I really cared about. And this, this is a pattern that's gone on most of my life and I still don't understand why it's attractive to me or has been. I would see someone who I really cared and loved, you know, cared for and loved and that they couldn't do anything unless they were shooting something. And I would see that it would be literally killing them. And that would be a good reason for me to try it. I don't know. I don't understand that. But that's what, that's a pattern that I developed. I saw it with my father. I saw it with very close friends and I've seen it with people who are no longer alive, you know. And I'm glad to say that I'm not doing that anymore. Because there was a stage in my life where I got to, uh, experimenting. Not like I thought experimenting was in the first place, but what happens to you if you do this much? You know, there was a time in my life when uh, a normal day would be to pull out whatever I could get my hands on and do it all at once. It wasn't do it till it was gone. It was do it all right then. And it would be enough to kill somebody. But for some reason, that was what I did. And I would sit there and go, well, this is what happens, and, and stay alive somehow. And I got it in my head that that was a, I don't know, somewhere along the line I got this verse, or it's not even a verse, it's just something in the Bible where uh, in the last days people will be trying to kill themselves and can't. And that's what I thought I was doing, I think. For some reason I thought I couldn't die. I guess that's that Superman deal that we did. Through the years... All this progressed, and I just got to where um, everything I was doing was on a road to killing me. The only thing that I was doing that wasn't destructive was trying to play music. But that was really quickly taking a back seat to everything else. I still cared about someday finding something that meant something to me inside and with another person or with other people. 
I still cared about growing somehow. But bit by bit, all of that was going somewhere in the past where uh, I couldn't reach it anymore. It was like a, it was like a, something that I couldn't reach anymore, something that I just could dream about. And the things that I was doing every day was more like a trudge just to keep, keep going because I didn't know how to stop anything I was doing or the predicaments I was in. And then one day about close to three and a half years ago, I started realizing that I could not live on the way I was going, but I could not stop either. I didn't know how to stop, and I knew that I couldn't keep going. That was a real strange place to be for me, because I literally could not imagine the next day without a big bag of dope and several bottles of, of whiskey. I thought that, uh, literally what I thought was that I would go on doing that until I died, and then it would be a lot better because I wouldn't have to deal with it anymore. And in my mind, that seemed like a real good solution because I wouldn't have to deal with it anymore, but the people that I was mad at would. You know? I don't know why that seems so neat to me. Uh, I don't know why I was that mad at people, you know? I guess I was probably mad at myself. It's really what it was. Because to be honest, at the time, I thought those people were really uh, trying to get revenge on me or whatever, and that's why they did the things that they were doing. And really... The truth of the matter was that I was just trying to get revenge on people that I couldn't understand, you know. But instead of instead of doing it till I died, what happened was uh, I collapsed and just gave up. It was it was funny because I saw it coming for a while, and the reason that I wouldn't let go and give up that fight in the first place was because of what other people would think. You know, what they would think. Not that uh, they would find out that I was getting loaded or not that they would find out how bad off I'd, I'd gotten, but w that they would think that I was weak because I gave up. And uh, it took a lot to find out that that was the stronger thing to do, was to say, I can't do this anymore. You know? I have to live instead of die. So I woke up. I say I woke up. I got up and went to a friend of mine's hotel room and uh, sat there shaking and said, you know, this is what's going on. And uh, they called me an ambulance. And we were in Germany at the time. We went to went to this hospital and uh, somehow somehow I got the nerve to get out of that hospital r real quick because. Uh, I thought it was kind of strange. They kept asking me questions and then ignored me when I answered them. Yeah. And uh, then it dawned on me that they were speaking German. <laughs> and, <laughs> no wonder they weren't listening, you know. <laughs> uh, I did get out of there. And went to a, it was a couple of days later, but I ended up going to a hospital. They're going to see a doctor in London. And he, he was someone that I'd heard of that I knew that they could do some, that this could do some good and give me some help. And he put me in a hospital for a few days and, and, uh, just kind of looked out after me for a little bit while he basically detoxed me. I said basically detoxed me because the guy didn't have that, that, Conventional of an idea of, of detox. It was, uh, if I needed, if I really needed a drink, I could have one. If I really thought I really needed a drink, he thought I should have one within about a five day period. Because he just, the way he looked at it and the way he told me was, if you've been drinking for 25 years, you're not going to stop in a minute, you know? Instead of giving me, uh, 
phenobarbital or whatever it is that they usually give you. He gave me, said, he just said, you can go have a drink if you really need one over the next five days. And in fact, he gave me, he gave me a drink on my birthday, which I was in the hospital. A little bitty cup of champagne. What really happened after that was I got out of the hospital and flew back to the States to go to treatment and I tried to get drunk on the plane. It didn't work. It didn't work. And what I'd done was I went, this is pretty funny to me, I went to my mother. She'd come over to see me in the hospital. I called her up and said, I called her and my girlfriend and said, look, I'm in the hospital. This is what's going on. They both were there the next day. I'm real grateful for that. It means a lot to me. They, uh, we were on our way back over to the States. And I was sitting there next to my mother. And I didn't have any money, so I borrowed $20 to go buy some cigarettes on the plane. And uh, she knew there was no machine. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I went and tried to find out how many crown rolls I could get, you know. And... uh there's never enough. Uh, I learned that a long time ago. There's never enough dope and there's never enough to drink. There's either too much or not enough. You know, there's never just enough. But I, uh, I went and tried anyway. And went back and I felt, I found I felt guilty already. I'm real good at the guilt. You know, I went straight back to the seat, sat down next to her. You know, and like, this is not what I did. You know, and she went, I kind of knew that, you know. And, uh, anyway, we went back, we got, we got, we landed and, and, uh, I went to the hotel room, stayed there until the next day went into treatment. I didn't expect to find out in treatment that that was one of the coolest places I'd ever been. That's what I found out, you know. It wasn't, uh, what I thought it was going to be at all. I went through the regular stuff, you know. What if they find out I'm in here? Who's they? And, you know, <laughs> and, and I don't want to be here and all, you know, all this stuff. But once I, once I got, once I started paying attention to what was going on in treatment, to recovery, it's been something that I've really wanted ever since. Not always been real good at sticking to a good, strong program. But at least I know that when I'm able to find those steps in my life, that it works. And it's really the only thing that does. Because anything else I'm doing is just trying to fix something else up to look the way I want it to look or to be the way I want it to be. Instead of working my way into living life. Well, what I found in treatment was the same thing that I find in a meeting when I'm in the right place. In my heart at a meeting, and that's a bunch of people trying to help each other live life and grow in it. It's always been something that I've wanted to know about. And it's always been something that I've wanted to do. It's not always been something that I've done. Sometimes I don't even know what grow means. But it's something that... uh I find every once in a while, once in a while I find growth. And then I feel like me. If that's not where I'm at, then I feel like a shell. With a bunch of static going on. That's really the way I feel. I don't know, in the, in the program, they have found the only real lasting happiness that I've ever had. And it lasts whether I can really reach it or not. I don't know if that makes sense to you or not, but I know that it's there even though I can't always feel it. Because I know it's not out of, it's not out of something that I've made or bought or conned somebody out of. It's something that's bound to be real. And I see it, I see it when I see it, other people come out of a real hard place to be into a more comfortable place with themselves. I know that must be growth. It's not just a new pair of boots or something, you know. I don't know. The hardest things that I've learned so far, I guess, is probably letting go of my own way, getting my own way, 
other people acting the way that I think they should act or looking the way that I think they should look. I'm not out of that yet. It's just that's my way, you know. My way is not the right way necessarily at all. And it's hard to admit that. It's hard to admit that I don't know it all. That's what I used to think. I used to think that if it wasn't done my way, that it was completely wrong and it couldn't be anything close to right because you just didn't know. I know it's kind of, it's, sometimes I find out that it's, it's real comfortable not knowing everything, you know. Not knowing anything, in fact. It's funny, I'm real uncomfortable saying that right now, but <laughs> that's the truth. I don't know, I just know that it, when I come to meetings, when I take the time to pray and to listen and to take a look at myself, and try to change that I grow. And when I try to offer that to someone else, I feel better. And that I don't have any need to drink or to take any drugs. And if that's what this program does, if that's all it does, then it's helped me a whole lot. Because that's all I used to know, was drinking and using drugs. It's really all I knew. Because I didn't know how I felt. I still don't always know how I feel. A lot of times I uh, still find myself confused about what I think and what I feel. I don't know the difference very often. And that's a scary place to be a lot of times. But slowly, day by day, that's working out. It's working out for the better. It's been uh, about three and a half years, I guess, close to three and a half years, since I've had to drink. And it struck me, it struck me New Year's Eve that to go and do what I had to do New Year's Eve was uh, a lot different this year than I've noticed it being in the past. You know, a couple of years ago it was like this. Last year it was kind of a daze. I was sick, but it was kind of a daze. This year I was actually happy to be alive and noticed that I didn't have to be high to be up till five in the morning or whatever it was, you know, and that it, that I could look out and, and realize that I was starting a new year with with new things to try to do, and new things to try to care about, and one of them was me, and one of them was y'all, and what, what I do with my life, and commitments, you know, commitments has been another thing that I've never been very good at in my life, or I could get caught up in something. Real good, you know. I could get caught up in the in the mirror combing my hair, you know, or uh, whatever. But commitments have not been something that I've been very good at, because I was more scared of making a commitment than I was following it through, you know. But I realized that I'm still alive now, and that's a that's an amazing thing to me. When I was 17, I thought I wouldn't make it to 21. When I made it to 21. I thought something was, something's up, you know. <laughs> you know, what's going on here? <laughs> and, uh, when I passed 30, I thought something's wrong. <laughs> I don't know. It's, I'm just glad to be alive today. Glad to be alive today. I don't know. I don't really have a whole lot to say about anything other than knowing that if I let this program and if I let God do what he's going to do in my life through you or through whatever, that it's a whole lot better than I ever could have done it myself before I came to this program. I thank you all for letting me be here with you. Whether I know what to say about it or not, it means a lot to me. And I thank you, okay? <laughs>